for all of your insurance needs, look no further than our primary sponsor, Jim Saxton State Farm Insurance Agency. The ATX OG has been insuring Austin for over three decades. And get this, Jim Saxton is a Longhorn legacy. He is the son of the late, great James Saxton, who was a Heisman finalist. Be sure to give him a call or better yet, visit his website, saxtoninsurance.com and tell him that the stories inside the Man Cave Boys recommended you. Wake your ass up or take a damn nap. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. It's time. You were t- I mean, Sean, you were twerking. That's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Murph, don't be a dick all your life. This is uh, one, of, one of the more fun podcasts I've ever done. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you're not talking about sports in the man cave, you... No, I bet not. So you're not a man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Hey, I think this guy, uh, Joe Cook, I think he deserves a, I don't know how else to call that, a Hall of Fame open like that. And I know when you sent those pictures, you had no clue uh, how they would be used. But I thought that was a grand opening, and it should have been for all the work you've done. Man, I, I appreciate it. It's uh, It's been a lot of fun over these past, uh, over these past, man, it's been, I've been doing been baseball for this is my tenth season now. I've been full time doing football for six years, but and I appreciate it. It's it's always fun every day. It's a challenge, it's a grind, but it's it's a blast. I wouldn't do anything else. Oh man, and it sh- it shows that your work, you know, when your passion shines, you put your heart into it. Uh, that's why I've always admired uh, your work. I think you and I crossed paths. I think my last five years of the TV career at K View here in Austin, and so Joe Cook, he is a writer uh, on various platforms mainly on on three sports and inside texas inside texas is where texas longhorn fans have really got to know who he is and by the way this special episode it's going to be abbreviated not the full two segment episode because joe has a ton of knowledge inside knowledge and good analysis of everything ut and even nfl draft and right now of course with UT football, they just wrapped up uh, their spring camp with uh, under Steve Sarkeesian, the second one. And and by the way, is since we have a host of sponsors now, which is great. It means when you have interest, we're growing and we're doing something right. Um, this special episode with the Joe Cook, sponsored by Kevin Hutchinson Realty Austin. He is a native of Austin, a unicorn, if you will. Uh, he's been in the real estate game for over two decades and now has expanded his knowledge into San Antonio. So there's that broad 85 mile stretch up by 35 and he's your guy. And, uh, he is very low keyed. He'll make it very comfortable. Kevin Hutch sent a realty Austin catch him on, uh, for your realty needs. Just look him up. He's high upon the uh, Google search engine, if you will. All right, Joe, first and foremost, we just st- started uh, spring camp, and now it's ended. Mm-hmm. How would you sum up what you saw in that spring camp? And we'll have a soundbite from Coach Sark about what he thought about it as he wrapped up uh, this second spring camp. Yeah, I- I'm not sure how much you can take just other than it was a developmental spring camp. Remember last yeah. year they come in and we're in the midst of COVID, uh, yeah. so there's regulations on – you know, what they can do. Uh, you're in the midst of, you know, introducing yourself uh, with it. when you're in COVID and you can't like interact. A lot of the time spent in practice isn't just developing. OK, you're you're this linebacker. You got to shoot this gap. It's like, oh, you're this linebacker and you're from this town. Oh, my, my family's from this town. There's there's a lot going on in that first yeah. spring uh, to where it's it's just a challenge, especially with everything going on with this one. Um the roster looks a lot more like how Steve Sarkeesian wants it. Um, he's got players at various positions that he wants them at. And now it's just, you know, not so much. Com- I mean, of course, there's going to be competition, but you're not trying to determine anything within 15 practices right. in March and April. You're just trying to get everybody better. I mean, you're, you're not trying to determine position battles. Right. You're trying to get everybody be- better and you're trying to see, okay, who are the guys that maybe come fall that, 
you know, I can rely on at this spot that I think could be a backup here or anything like that. Who can, who do I want on this roster? Because that's going to be a crunch, especially with some of the COVID scholarship regulations drying up uh, in the next couple of years. So um, overall, I, I would just kind of describe it as a spring where my biggest takeaway, and I think Sarkeesian said this after the spring game, it wasn't so much about anything on the field, to be honest yeah. with you. I mean, yeah, you got to look at the quarterbacks and uh, we got another battle. Uh, you look at the skill position players on offense and you get excited about that. But from what players said, from what Coach Sarkeesian said, you kind of look at everything and you're just like, well, they seem like a team now. Like everybody, like Anthony Cook said it best after the spring game. Everybody who's here wants to be here. And he also said not everybody who was here last year wanted to be here. So if you've got a, wow. after a first year, which always, first years are always bad. Ignore Fred Akers, ignore Mac Brown and the Heisman campaign. First years are typically pretty bad across the board at any college football job just because you're changing so much. Now after the bad, everybody who's stuck through it is around, wants to be here and uh, I think they're riding high on on that cultural aspect just as much as they're riding high on like development and fundamentals and that type of thing. You know, you made a great point, and in your analysis of it all, that encapsulates everything from winter conditioning to the end of spring camp, which it was last weekend. Um, one thing that really has stood out is the turnover of the roster. I mean, I, I've lost track of how many people they signed to now we're still having guys enter the transfer portal. I mean, what is your assessment now? Will there be more guys enter the portal now that we're post spring and maybe adding more pieces? Cause it's, you know how the Texas fan base is. It's, it's not hostile is not the word almost said hostile, but they really ride the waves of every transfer portal possibility. Yeah, I, I think with the portal, there's there's two things you have to consider. One is kids want playing time, and now that they can go elsewhere and get playing time immediately, they'll take advantage, whether right or wrong, uh, whether it's the right decision or not. The other thing is you have to look at um, <clears throat> just roster numbers. Steve Sarkeesian said something, I think, in November or December about how, you know, we're trying to bring in 33 new players, and everybody's like, whoa, 33 players. Well, you got a 25-man signing class, more, maybe even that, you get eight or so transfers, boom, that's 33 right there. Uh, and, of course, you got to always deal with some guys at the bottom of the roster, some guys kind of in the middle of the roster who aren't happy, and even guys at the top of the roster aren't happy. We haven't seen any of that third category yet. Uh, but the, the portal, I mean, at some sometimes, yes, it's an opportunity uh, right. for, for players to go and put their name in and, and see what, what if there's greener grass elsewhere. But there's always been kids who transfers out of who transfer mm -hmm. out of programs. And one thing about the portal is it just put it in a place where people uh, with sources, wink, wink, can read. That, that's all it was. You know, kids transfer all the time. Uh, but now we just have this aggregated place where they're all in there. And you just see like, <laughs> wow, look at, you know, 5,000 kids from FBS to Division three wanting out yeah. in, in all sports. And I think there's a freak out about that. But as it pertains to Texas, you know, it, the Yes, you're probably going to see um, a little bit more over the course of spring just because it always happens in the spring. Now, NIL may throw a wrench into it because it's it, it's good to be a player at Texas. Um, <laughs> but, but I think what, what uh, p fans have to realize is now you have to kind of draw a line. It's like, yeah, I know it's good to be a player at Texas, but I need, I need a winner or, or yeah. I need someone who's going to help my team. Um, you know, it, and that's a fine line that every single coach plays – the important thing for Texas is just making sure that I think it's by some point in August or below that 85. And that's going to be, that's going to be something to watch over these next few weeks and something we've written about even today over on inside Texas. You mentioned that you need a winner, a return on the investment, so to speak, and in business terms, that's, there's a fine line, there's a short window. And I know everyone wants a return on investment on, on all quarterbacks. Uh, I had a, a local high school coach who is uh, new to the area. Well, not new to coaching, but new to the area who's been in a lot of those practices. And he said, hey, Malik Murphy is the quarterback of the future. Not now, but of the future. So having said that, you know, Quinn Ewers, we all know the story behind him. And, and the quarterback room now, 
What is uh, your take on Quinn Ewers? Is it his job as of right now, if you were to name a starting quarterback? R reporter mode? No, I don't think Steve Sarkeesian is going to do that right now in, in spring, um, even with May 1st, which is a big deadline coming up. I don't think he's going to be like Dave Aranda. And kudos to Dave Aranda for making right. the call and letting Gary Bohannon uh, find opportunity. I don't yeah. think – not sure, but don't think Steve Sarkeesian is going to do that just because he went through last year. He used both quarterbacks last year. And in his perfect world, he would no matter who's the starter, he's going to want both quarterbacks next year. Just kind of my own opinion. I mean, if there's a semi-equal, like here to here, even like yeah. grasp of the offense where this is Card and this is uh, Quinn Ewers, I'd be surprised if it wasn't Quinn Ewers. Not just because of the arm talent, but just he's younger. Um, you, you build, you kind of galvanize a team around yeah. a guy and, and everybody likes both those guys. Yeah. Um, but the thing with, with Quinn Ewers is while he may struggle with the mundane struggle is a strong word yeah. while he needs to get the mundane down, he can make those throws. Like you saw to Isaiah and Aor in the spring game. And that's something that Hudson card has struggled with. It really has. So, and, and with Steve Sarkeesian's emphasis on downfield shots, you want that guy who can take the top off of defense. You want that guy who can hit the, you know, Xavier Worthy who's running a, a, a 4 3 9, you know, 50 yards into the route. You want that. Now, if Hudson Card can prove adept at doing that more than he's done so in his career, while adding all the other things that he has, like experience in the offense, accuracy uh, in the underneath stuff, then, you know, it, it might be tough to, un to unseat him and uh, make him, you know, the back to back winner of quarterback battles. But, just knowing what I know about the offense and knowing what I know about Quinn Ewers' ability and and work ethic, it's hard for me not to think that sometime in mid-August, I guess it would be, that Quinn Ewers is going to get the call. Uh, but um, it, it's that's a tough decision. And both these guys are like – both these guys are hard workers. That, that's another thing. It's just, you know, you're, you're, you're picking – you have to pick someone. You can't play yeah. both. And it's the most important position in sports, as Steve Sarkeesian says. So – you have to pick one, and in this day and age, one is probably going to go seek playing time elsewhere, and you have to try and balance that if you're Steve Sarkeesian. Now, to get to your point about Malik Murphy, I think there was this weird rational, – not rationalization, but just this weird decision among a lot of Texas fans to be like, this is Tyrone Sloops 2.0. And that couldn't be further from the truth, in my opinion, because you watch – was it White House – High school, yeah. white oh, right. night and day. White right, yeah. He was what he ran for. He he's got like the state record for rushing yards in a game, right, or something like that. And he was on a two and eight football team. One and nine. Malik, one and nine. Yeah, exactly. Malik <laughs> Murphy is not Tyrone Swoop, or Tyrone Swoops is not Malik Murphy. Malik Murphy has passing ability. They may they may look similar in stature, but they play completely different games, and. You know, you can. I know everybody loves UIL football, and as they should. But CIF, they play good ball out there, especially in Southern California. And he helped his team get to a state title, win a state title. So their games couldn't be completely different. Now, that's not to say he's not raw as a as a passer, because he yeah. still is. He's got some footwork stuff to work on. His release is a little long, but you can kind of get away with that when you're six four, six five, stuff like that. But uh, he he's someone that Steve Sarkeesian – while still pursuing high schooler Quinn Ewers, this is like, I want this guy. I'm going to go get him. Yeah. Use West Coast Connections, got him. And Malik Murphy has, and, and I think this says as much about Malik Murphy as it does the other quarterbacks who are on campus in that three, four, five, six spot. Malik Murphy was kind of seeing some third string reps as much as he was able to on that ankle during the spring. So I, I, I see what you're talking about. Um, they have a big line in the water looking for Arch Manning. Uh, but, you know, and Malik Murphy someone who's going to take a couple years probably to get exactly mm -hmm. where Steve Sarkeesian wants him. But there's a lot of tools, a lot of traits, and just a lot of good personality, too, to where it's – whatever the quarterback battle may look like, I guess, in 2024, that's going to be a fun one to watch as well. I, I like to say I want to fast forward to that, but I still, you know, I want I want to see how this whole drama unfolds, as we all do. Um, and I'm still in the in the in the side of the debate that I think Hudson Card, 
I, I we don't, I don't have a clue, but I still think he could be a factor as a receiver. I still because you you and I, I know he was a great yeah. receiver at Lake Travis. Yeah, Matthew Baldwin forced him there. Yeah, but you know quarterbacks they, they like playing quarterback, and maybe if it comes <laughs> into a dead pin like a dire pinch here at Texas, but at the same time you got to protect your quarterback room too. Maybe yeah. he could he I think what you're saying is he a hundred percent has the capability to do it, yeah. knowing his athleticism, but whether he has the will, and I don't blame him for if he doesn't have the will, not wanting to do it either. But I, yeah. I see exactly what you're saying. So you talk we talk about the quarterbacks, and we talk about uh, part of the reason I think that position failed last year. So many things did, you know, you at least the second half of games was the performance of the old line, which has not been a strength, if you will, in quite some time. There's been some great offensive linemen, but as a unit, um, that old line situation will drastically change in August when all those guys from uh, who you know who are tied to the pancake factory, so to speak, the NIL. But should Texas fans tap the brakes? on the expectations of this position, at least until 2023. They may not have a choice not to, to be honest. So <laughs> I'm pretty confident in Junior Angulao and Jake Majors. And I think whoever ends up being right guard, whether that be Hayden Connor or someone from that 2022 class is going to be quality. Um, in recent years, between Connor Williams and Sam Cosme, it seemed like left tackle always seemed okay. And then you're just concerned about everything else. Now, at least personally, my concern isn't really everywhere else. It's just straight up on left tackle. Yeah. Um, they're not going to put Christian Jones there. It seems like they are saying, if you're going to play tackle for Texas, you're going to play right tackle. And it's something he did in 2019, either 2019 or 2020. I think 2020. And he did well. He did good, bad, you know, but he is not a left tackle. We saw it all last year. Um, Andre Karich, you, we don't know. I mean, they swapped off. Um, and Hayden Connor, who played left tackle during the spring game, that's not going to be a spot. So this may be a situation where, you know, you're bringing in seven guys in this 2022 class. As uh, I think Moro Jomo semi-famously said, you know, math says one of them is probably going to play this year. Yeah. Um, and when the, the highest rated one is Kelvin Banks, a tackle <clears throat> I'd say that he's going to come in and at least, if not win a job, he's going to fight like hell to get it. And if something were to ha happen to the line, a shakeup, he'll be there first. Now, going against Will Anderson in game two, if you name a true freshman offensive tackle as your starter, is a uh, is a pretty big risk. Um, but, I mean, you're bringing in seven guys and for a room that's going to have – think either 15 or 16 scholarship guys by the time fall starts mm -hmm. like one of them is probably going to see playing time and the odds yeah. are it's going to be one of the top three of banks Devin devon campbell or maybe neto umio zulu from from allen um but it I, i'm not totally concerned about left guard over to right tackle i'm not really concerned about um you know running the ball that much I, I just left tackle and their ability to protect whoever the wins the quarterback jobs blindside. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the offense's fortunes is going to go that way just because there's so many weapons. I mean, yeah. you got uh, Jatavian Sanders picking up tight end. You have uh, Xavier Worthy, Isaiah Nayor, B. John Robinson, Roshan Johnson, Quinn Ewers, Hudson Card, like all those guys. Like that's a skill talent that you don't normally see at Texas or at least have it in the past 10 years. And I think they're going to try and figure out the best way via the offensive line to try and get them, uh, you know, set up what Sarkeesian calls a run first offense and then mm -hmm. set up the ability to take on downfield shots. So, and, and you know, you mentioned Sanders. I think that will be key, you know, especially tight ends uh, sealing off that, you know, the edge, you know, to protect out of the blind side or, or either side, really. Let's uh, let's face it, both sides were, at times, were weaknesses last year. Um, and, and to stay on the theme of in the trenches, the D-line, I, I like to think that that's going to be a potential position of strength. I mean, you especially on the ends. And, but you have some key 
contributors who were starters last year. I mean, are you in agreement with that, or am I just I, do I need to settle down about thinking that way? I would not be confident about end right now. I really wouldn't. Okay. I think that you, you know, Todd or remember Todd Orlando, he ran that three man front. Right. And, you know, he recruited a three man front for 2017, 2018, 2019. Boom, got fired. But still, that's years of recruiting. And that's a lot of the guys on the roster. Now they try to address that with just throwing numbers at defensive end, both last cycle in 2021 and this cycle in 2022. But a, the, the bulk of your roster was recruited to be in, in a three down system. And that's why you see a lot of Texas's talent on the defensive line be the interior guys. Um, Keandre Coburn, Coburn, Moro Ojimo, Tavondre Sweat, Byron Murphy. He, he fits a little bit different mold considering he came in after the Orlando era. But uh, Alfred Collins, like all those guys, those are interior defensive linemen. And I think that's why you're going to see an emphasis at least on defense on those guys just because aside from Ovi Agofu, there's – there's not a lot of edge talent on this team. There really isn't. And that's why they're after O'Shawn Mathis from Maynard really, really hard right now. So um, defensively in the trenches, the thing is, those guys are all, you think, pretty good. Yeah. Like they're starters at the Power 5 level, but they've never done anything spectacular. They really haven't. Um, but they're steady. And I think that's why you're going to see them probably – take on a lot of responsibilities for this defense, be the, the where they emphasize on the defensive line this upcoming fall, no matter it, whether O'Shawn Mathis signs or not, just because I think that if they get O'Shawn, O'Shawn Mathis, there's such a drop-off after him, even with Baron Sorrell and Ovi Gofu having really good springs, that they know that the, the bread may be buttered by the interior defensive line guys. So having said that, with Gary Patterson now on the staff, and he, you know his trend was recruit great athletes with speed, and then a lot of them, and in, in historically in the TCU program when he was there, he would spin them down to other positions, like certain DBs go to linebacker, linebacker to DNs. Do you see any of those guys on that roster who could spin down from maybe a linebacker to a DN? I don't think specifically like, like an edge rushing D end. Um, part of me kind of wanted DeMarvian Overshone to maybe try a nickel or strong side line outside linebacker role, but I think he's just too valuable on the on the inside. Um, so I, I really don't think there are guys who could do that, and that's why they they're after it in the portal. Um, they're after it hard on, on the on the recruiting trail and. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't think that's on that roster right now. I think what they have is a lot of spaceish, like space uh, athletes that they, you know, want to be um, as as linebackers, but no one who's going to, you know, beat a tackle one on one or anything like that. There's there's no Malik Jeffersons on this team, <laughs> and I mean, granted, he's a first team All American. Uh, it'd be cool if De, uh, Demarvin Overshone was that, but I, I don't think there are any Malik Jeffersons on this team who could do that inside-outside type of thing. DBs, the backside the corners. You know when they're playing man, is that it? Would you consider that those guys maybe in a much better situation than may? Well, having I'm trying to position this in a way to be objective because there were times you could argue that some of the DBs were getting beat last year because there was not a pass for us mm-hmm. consistently. Now we, we don't know yet if that will be the case, if that will improve, but what is your, your take on the DB situation overall? So at least at corner, I like the options they have there. They're going to probably run a lot of what looks like a three, four. It's not exactly a three, four, but what looks like a three, four. So it means you're not going to have a nickel back, and that's going to mean probably Deshaun Jameson and Jade Barron are your top two corners. Now, if they go nickel, they'll probably bring in uh, Jade Barron at nickel. He's had a great mm-hmm. spring practice. He's done well there. Uh, gives you coverage ability at that nickel spot. And then you have Ohio State transfer Ryan Watts at the other corner, boundary corner. And you, if you go, you know, if you go to a practice, you look around and you see number six. You're like. Oh, there's their middle linebacker. You're like, wait, that's a corner? He's 6'3. He's 200, he's 216 pounds, but he's just huge. <laughs> long, long arms. And you saw him throughout the course of the uh the spring game. He would escort, basically escort wide receivers 
away from the route. Like he is physical. That is a, a boundary corner. So I'm, I like what they have at cornerback. Mm-hmm. And I, I think Terrence Brooks, even though he had a rough go on that uh, Rashawn Johnson run as an early enrollee, he'll be fine. We'll see what else happens from there, but that's three and a half, four good guys here. You're, you're, you like um, at nickel. I like uh, the work that Jade Barron's done, but the guy behind him and credit to him was Westlake's Michael Taffy. Who's or Taff. Who's a walk on. Um, they like, they've looked at Jaron Thompson there. They've looked at Anthony cook there, but they've moved those guys back to safety uh, for the most part. And safety was a position. I think that may have been the most surprising you know, surge, I think, throughout the uh, the course of the spring is that safety with guys who had moved there from other positions, Anthony Cook and Keaton Crawford, those guys took really well to that position. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, like you mentioned earlier, it's all it, it's all intertwined. You know, if the pass rush can't get anything, you got five seconds to run a, a deep cross and, you know, no one's going to be able to cover that if, if it, it, so it all kind of depends a little bit on the pass rush, but I th- think that this secondary, A, because they're a little bit more experienced, some of them are more uh, physically gifted, B, because they know a little bit better what all these coaches are running and, and some of the coverage is asked, I think it'll be better, but I think a lot of it depends on that pass rush just to just to start. And that – that's kind of tied to what Sark said in, in his post-game interview with Longhorn Network, what, all of what you just said. And I think it's all tied a, a little bit to um, culture change and, of course, understanding what direction they're trying to go. And this is what Sark had to say. I'll, I'll be honest with you, though. Like, for winter conditioning through spring practice, where we're at as a team, you know, collectively playing as one about the team first mentality – I think has been such a difference from where we were a year ago. Now, obviously, staff continuity, you know, schematically, development of players, all those things have progressed to make that happen. Uh, but where we are just as a football team, the culture, what we're about today, as opposed to a year ago this time, it, it's not even close. Not even close. I mean, you alluded to it at the beginning of this episode. Do you – I mean – you're into it. You're an intuitive guy. I mean, you, do you get that f- sensation, that feel that it's just it feels different in Moncrief and when you're around that program? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't hear aside from more Ojomo, we can get into that later too, because I think that's worth <laughs> worth talking about. But like everybody seen there, there's no it doesn't seem like there are cracks. You know, even going throughout like any media session last year, it's like, oh, we, we got to do this. We got to do this. We got to change this. We got to get guys along. You don't hear that. I mean, granted, we had pretty limited uh, player opportunities right. during this past spring uh, just for a wide variety of reasons. But it all just seems like Anthony Cook said, everybody who wants to be here is here. Um, and remember, uh, like I said, first years suck. Like, Charlie went six and six and got his butt whipped by Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Tom went six and six and he caught a Missouri team uh, with a good defense. He he did credit to him for that, but they're not fun. Like they're, they're not supposed to be good. Remember that tech game in 2017? It was Tim Beck had a bad game. Herman had a bad game. Uh, Sam Ellinger had a bad game. You know uh, I'm trying to think what else in 2014 with, with Charlie's first year like that, that Baylor game where they shut down a, a prolific shut down is a relative term, but they strongly we played strongly against a really good Baylor offense. Yeah. And they could just manage one touchdown. Like th- there are flaws in, in year ones that always come to show just because it's such a drastic change. And, you know, I always kind of wonder that even if Sark went five and seven last year, if it was win, 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 loss, loss, win, win, loss, win, you know, instead of just that streak, it, maybe he would be perceived a little bit differently, um, but he, that's that's not how it worked, unfortunately. Uh, but I mean, it just always kind of hangs in there that that five and you know first year stink, and I think yeah, that never are easy to deal with. Yeah, it, it's you're always changing something from the last guy, whether good or bad. Um, and so I'm 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 kind of of the opinion that yeah, it, it, it's different. I think that kind of goes back to earlier, like that. They're, you know, we're kind of watching and waiting on the the transfer portal over at Inside Texas, but we're watching and waiting. 
and waiting. And, and you know, Jaden Hullaby jumped in or announced he was going to jump in there today. Myron Warren announced as well. Uh, but they, you know, not everybody, everybody seems bought in and, and wanting to help and, and do that. So I, I do kind of agree with, with Sarkeesian and, uh, and, and his, you know, just his opinion on that and what he said on LHN. You know, it, it's, I was going to ask you, and I don't think it'd be fair to me to ask you about your projection for next year, because I think there's still so many pieces to put together and we're going to see more movements to the roster as you've alluded to. Um, transfer portal. And I, and, and I think this is, and I know this term, I hate it because it freak COVID spawned it. The new norm, the new norm is the portal. The new norm in, for college football is constant movement on your roster from year to year. So Moro Ajomo, that whole situation, I, I didn't have a problem with him. It was obviously kind of what Sark said how he went about it on that platform. I had no problem with what he said. Some people right. disagree with me because calling out players, you keep it in the locker room. But what he said, the intention, I thought was productive in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. So did you get the full – did you ever hear the full audio? Like all the edited 25 version. minutes. I didn't see the whole five minutes. Oh, it was 25 minutes. 25 that was longer minutes. than we got with Steve Sarkeesian that week. <laughs> um, so, I mean – so here's the thing. I think what a lot of people saw is a, as you know, as I know very well, people like to dunk on Texas. It gets yep. clicks. Oh, look at them. Oh, they're five and seven. Like they, they love to do that. And so any cracks in the armor, any, you know, cracks in the castle, they're going to be like jump on real quick. <laughs> and we are all in an era where there's a lot more sympathy for players as opposed to coaches. And I get that. And I'm, I'm with it, too. I, I think that when you're paid $5 million a year, $9 million a year versus someone who – and for the record, Moro Jomo does not like NIL. Uh, not at all. That was one of the things. Like, he's like, you know, it's tough to build a team when, as he said, you got guys chasing money, got guys yeah. chasing women, and you got guys chasing alcohol. So I think what the national – people who saw maybe clips, maybe just saw quotes, maybe saw stuff like that misconstrued is that Ojomo called out very obvious and apparent issues with the program that's happened over the past 10 years that many people have been typing out on message boards, talking at the water cooler, talking in bars. They've been saying all the same things that Ojomo said over the past 10 years. And I don't think that there was a really an issue with Hey, saying, hey, we need guys here who want to be here, who want to win, exactly. who hate winning or hate losing more than winning. That's not where the issue is. And it sounds like you get that too. And granted, I'll I'll defend him a little bit in that he was at very specifically about Jalen Garth and Andre Carrick. But he was like, it's time for those guys. They got to move. They got to get going. They gotta, they gotta do better. They gotta, and it was almost like, you know. You know, normally and you've been in those situations. They normally say stuff like, oh, he's been working hard. He's been he's got to do this. He went a little further than that. And hey, as a writer, as a TV person like you were, you know, like you're you're sitting there like, yes. All right. This is this is perfect. This is content like this is revealing. This is the peek behind mm -hmm. the curtain we wanted to see. Compelling. Yeah, exactly. And it's great. I loved writing that story. But he called out players specifically. He basically fully admitted what I mentioned earlier about them. Like, Hey, we're going to be running a three down front. He fully outright said, Hey, we need that TCU defensive end. Um, in a story about somebody else, he kind of inadvertently said that Tavondre sweat hadn't really been doing it until this year. And most importantly, and I think this is greatly forgotten. is like, you know, Hi, you know, I, I drank before I was 21 when I was in college. Um, but you don't outright admit that. You, right. you just don't. And that's where Sark was like, hold on, hold on a second. Like you're, I get where you're coming from. I get you have the great intentions, but it's what Sark said. <clears throat> this was not the right form, F-O-R-U-M, for that. He wanted that to be said inside a lot. He revealed, you know, whether it be schematic, you know, just straight up revealing it. That's not a player's job. Um, calling out people in the media as a college dude. Like, even pros are wary about that. It's not his job. Saying they had a desperate need at a position, especially referencing someone, 
not his job. And I think that's what was really missed. So they see like, oh, Steve Sarkeesian silencing a player for speaking the truth. No, that, that, that wasn't what happened. Steve Sarkeesian was being like, hey, there's a lot of truth to what he said. A lot of what he said definitely rings true and it's something I would have said. But he said it at the wrong place. And he also revealed some details, including details about, you know, players going out to 6th Street and stuff like that, that, that you know, any anybody could, any, we, like I said, we all know college kids do that. But if you're at school, why? You can go into a living room and say, these players, all they do is they go to Austin, Texas, and they party. They're not playing football. Meanwhile, you go to, I don't know, Clemson, South Carolina, little old Clemson. All there's to do, and we have this beautiful facility where every need that your son could ever want is here. He won't get into trouble. That's just immediate negative recruiting fodder, and I think a lot of people miss that aspect of mm -hmm. the Ojomo story. Uh, all in all, I, I think there's, to me, the way I view all that, there are some things that I thought that he, he probably should have avoided the, you know, the specific names. But overall, what I loved about it, Joe, was simply the fact that there's frustration. He right. wants it. He wants it. And I know that most 90% of those players at any program, let's remove the fact that it's Texas across the jersey. They know the expectation. They came to Texas for that expectation to play for championships at least. And that has not been done. Even the 2018 team, they did play for a championship, but there was some underachieving going on. But that was a good team. That was a really good team. They ended up winning the Sugar Bowl, as we all know. So they did win a championship. But the fact is, this has been this has gone on for too long at Texas. The mediocrity, um, underachieving. And there's been some systemic issues for so long that has no, had nothing to do with Herman or even Sark or even uh, let's go CDC. I think it's a it's a pro, uh, it's in progress right now, the improvements. But this is all coming to surface. The guys who are going to change the program, in my opinion, are on campus or will be. Mm -hmm. They will combine to change this. And I think the fan base is starting to realize, wait a minute, we're not who we think we are yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We haven't achieved enough. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's been since that one game, that one season where they played for the conference title, hadn't been much. And, I mean, we all, we all want to talk it up, but – you know, I, I think that's why they're they're going after someone who's been with some of the best, or they they did hire someone who's been with some of the best coaches, and oh yeah, has a really exciting offensive system. So yeah. I, I think the progress is being made. Who knows if it'll play out exactly this year? Because there's still going to be growing pains. There there really are, and you know I think uh, even even Tom Herman's year, that West Virginia game went fun. That defense showed a lot of you know problems. Uh, as much fun as USC was, as much, you know, they lost to Maryland. Like, it, there's ups and downs, but there's – it should definitely be more ups and downs this year or else something's wrong. And, yeah. and I don't think anything – I don't sense that happening uh, unless just something goes mega awry uh, for, for the defense. And I don't think that will happen considering who they have now in that room uh, with them. But, you know, this this is – this you got to see progress this year, and it seems like everybody is uh, – ready to help out in that regard they go to a bowl game that's progress in my opinion you know from uh but reaching eight wins is probably the target regardless of what happens against alabama here in austin um one thing that i, I know you love talking about is baseball um this current uh, you know joe's an h-town guy and you did didn't you play college baseball no, I wish. I I maybe I don't did. wish, but I uh, no, I did not play. Uh, I didn't play college ball. I don't know why I thought you did. You know, hey, you have that look and aura uh, that you had a college baseball past. Uh, so we all know what happened to Tanner Witt. That, that was a blow to the staff. And you know how it, when you have an injury to a starter, it trickles down to your bullpen, everybody. So you got to readjust innings when you go in, whatnot. So people have been forced to grow up. Right now, they have a riding a five-game five win streak. Uh, started the year off number one. We all know that story. Do you like what you see enough to say 
as they head into this huge Oklahoma State series this weekend. OSU, the highest rated Big 12 team in the country, of the 428 college baseball polls that exist. Uh, do, you, do you like where this team is now to where you think they could walk away by Sunday evening having won that series? Or dare I say sweep another Big 12 series? It's going to be tough. Like Oklahoma State's good, and, and yeah. David Pierce got to talk to him today. Uh, he likened to them to an SEC team, which kind of means they can hit mm-hmm. the ball, uh, they run, and uh, they've got a they've got a good ace on Friday. But there's no end, and, and there are guys having ups and downs. But there's no end to this Texas lineup. Like yeah. this is I've been covering Texas baseball since 2013 when I was a freshman at UT. Um, this is the best hitting team I've seen. It's maybe one of the best hitting teams that Texas has had ever. Uh, I agree. And I think you're seeing that with, A, how David Pierce goes at it strategically. He's not bunning as much. Um, And, B, you just got someone like Ivan Melendez and Murphy Staley who are just (laughs) different. They are – those guys have – they're they're all Americans. They they really are. And 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 both are probably candidates for, you know, Golden Spikes, Dick Hauser. Um, You also have faith in Pete Hansen. Now he's going up against another ace – uh, on the other side for, for Oklahoma State, but Pete's been Mr. Reliable, and he has been over the past two, Dud. three years. He really has. Um, so, uh, you know, and the thing is, whenever you're facing Texas and you get to Sunday, whoever that Sunday guy is, even in the Big 12, they're not used to what that Texas lineup can produce. And then you get to the Sunday middle relief guy, and then the second middle relief guy, they're not used to seeing anything like this Texas lineup where the six hole hitter, Skylar Messenger, is hitting north of 300 in a park that's never been considered hitter friendly. Never. Uh, so, like the fact that they have the batting length in this lineup that they do makes them a factor in every series. Now, the problem is they may have to win games nine seven uh, yeah. just because they have a bullpen where uh, they have a lot of stuff guys but they don't have guys who have been very good with their command and control and some guys are making progress in that area um some guys are just very hit or miss in that area um and that's not typical of a texas team just to have a lot of pitchers who Mm. most of these guys are kind of in that either year one or year two of their development whereas last year you look at some of the arms that they had like cole quintanilla i think he was a third or fourth year Mm. guy Colby Kubachek, third or fourth year guy. Uh, Tanner Witt's a unicorn. Maybe not a unicorn, but a you know a, a diamond. He's not right. a guy that they had to build a, a repertoire for. Um, you know, Aaron Nixon was the same way. Uh, but a, all these arms that they're really relying on, they've had to. They're in, they're for the most part, and they're like first or second year in the program, and. And critically, they have not developed as fast as they should have mm-hmm. uh, at this point for how much they're pitching. Um, now, they've they've come along some. I mean, Texas still has a decent team ERA. Not that that's fully indicative of everything. But you and I have watched all the games. I know you've been – I know where you've been sitting and watching games. Um, <laughs> like, we, we see that, yeah, even though if they're top 30 in ERA or something like that, that there's just problems uh, with, with the staff. Uh, as far as just just general strike throwing, um, that's the thing that's going to limit this team, um, and you know that's why right now I think they're a tenth tenth ranked in. Mm-hmm. I pay attention to D one. Uh, yeah, I think that, baseball America start, in my opinion. Baseball America is starting to move them up. They're still considered a host. If they win this series, what that means they have West Virginia and Kansas left. Does that sound right? think so uh because and both of those are very winnable maybe you're not going to win the big 12 i I think that's going to be a real tough task even though you've Mm -hmm. taken series versus tcu Mm -hmm. and oklahoma state who are up there but the big 12 winner normally has six seven eight losses and they're at six right now Mm -hmm. so you can only afford one maybe two over the next nine conference games that's tough it's doable But I don't know if this team has that in them. But at at that same time, you take two or three this weekend and you're happy as can be and you're definitely back in that top eight conversation, maybe if you're not in that Big 12 title conversation. 
That that's a that is a great analysis of it all. I mean, the lineup is there to if they need to win at the plate. You know, that it was just disturbing some of like the first the front end of that Air Force doubleheader midweek, of course, where they just didn't have a great day. Uh, and that happens in baseball. Baseball is very cruel. So cruel sport. When you look at overall picture, I do, and Big 12's always had good baseball strength. Uh, but I do think this is one of their stronger years as a conference. There's six really, six good teams. And Oklahoma's been hot lately. So, yeah, you're right. I, I think that's going to be tough for them to, they can maybe afford two more losses. And, I don't even know how to segue from that to this NFL draft. We we be we're we're here. The mm -hmm. NFL draft is here. Um, what angle can we take here? What are your diamonds in the rough? Whom you've covered? I guess that's a more focused down way to approach the NFL draft subject. Let's see. Well, we can go from the Texas perspective, and you kind of just look at the two guys that were sent to the combine from Texas and yeah. one was a kicker that says a little bit about where the state of the program is right now. Granted, I love Cameron Dicker. Dicker. Um, I, I think he, here's the thing. He's more, you know, likable as a pro yeah. probably as a punter and he did great as a punter. Yes. He um, did. he was, you know, now one of the best punters to ever come out of college football is in his draft class, which may hamper his, his draft stock, but he has kind of that multi-positional versatility He's good on kickoffs. He's great punting to where I don't know if he's going to get picked, but he's going to get picked up pretty quick. Um, yeah. The other guy is Josh Thompson, who played a couple positions, uh, got dinged up a good amount over his five-year career, uh, and just he has phenomenal phenomenal physical traits. I think, what was it? Brandon Jones was a fifth-round pick, if that yeah. sounds right. For Miami. Yeah. Uh, Josh Thompson has better testing numbers than than Brandon Jones did. We see it, we saw how Brandon Jones could could play on the field, but he didn't tackle particularly great, and he, you know, he, he did a lot more athleting than cornerbacking. Maybe that still sneaks him into that top the, that seventh round or something like that. But if you had to ask me whether they get two picked, one picked, or nobody picked. Kind of think the say the the better the better odds are on nobody getting picked. Unfortunately, now I'll go to the Texans real quick because you know they as I'm I'm keeping an eye on it and they picked yeah. up Derek Stingley. Um, I would pick. strong there. I don't think there's anybody in college football who had a better 2019 than on defense because Joe Burrow exists than Derek Stingley. Like that guy, as good as Joe Burrow was for that offense. Derek Stingley was just as good for that defense and special teams. 2020 came along, 2021 came along. And he had what, you know, durability issues, didn't play that yeah. much. Um, but he still got picked third overall, and the Texans needed that. Um, they're pretty good at offensive tackle right now. They probably could have used an edge guy, but they got that 13th pick. And they're also in year two of a rebuild. So I, I like what they got. That was one of their biggest needs as a right. cornerback. Um, and I, I really like where, where they went with that. Um, it's just strange, man. There's no, there's no court. There's no high level quarterback this year. Mm -hmm. no, your your best strange. quarterback is from Pitt or Liberty. Like that says yeah. a lot right there. And that Liberty. And, and next year is going to be next year is going to be a hell of a class between uh, I bet Spencer Rattler goes, but the, the jewels are going to be CJ Stroud and, oh. and Bryce Young. And uh, I'm trying to think who else, uh, I guess is Malik Hooker at Tennessee. Is he going to be a junior? Like anyway, those player. those two right there, those are going to lead the way. Those are going to be the guys that you know are the eye openers. So it, it you know it, it's just an odd draft, and that's why you're seeing you know tackles, defensive ends, and then you're kind of sneaking some cornerbacks in there. Once we get to about ten or something like that. You're going to see all that that deep wide receiver class start going and going and going. That's amazing. I still I'm still uh, tongue tied or shocked that you mentioned Liberty University's quarterback. Uh, amazing what Hugh Freeze has done for exactly. a uh, transitional program, if you will. It's uh, so Joe. Usually, I know this was abbreviated. We wanted to focus more on Texas, and we have. 
there's been a lot going on. You know, a, a lot of people care. And, you know, usually we're, we spread it out. And usually second segment is uh, for UT sports. But I, I had to get someone. I definitely value your opinion and everything that you cover and do a great job. But in uh, this is maybe the best part of the, each episode. The man cave story brought to you by Jim Saxton State Farm Insurance Agency. As you saw at the beginning of Westlake OG, and he's been doing this for about God, three plus decades. I just put age on him. And he's a Longhorn legacy, as we all know. Um, so if you call or just go on, he, he prefers you to log on to SaxtonInsurance.com and go from there. But once you talk to those guys, they make it really simple. For example, I bought a new truck recently and I needed to include the truck, change it on the policy done in 30 minutes from when I called that that quick and I had a piece of paper to put in my app in that time frame oh not a paper but you know it was emailed to me went into the app so I could drive legally with uh, insurance that's how easy it is but Joe JC is there a man cave story do you love talking about maybe all these years now covering UT and other sports is there one instance maybe in a press availability or an interaction with uh, the media core or a coach that uh, an event or maybe anything from growing up in Houston that you love talking about that would be deemed a man cave story. Man, let's see. I'm trying to think of anything <laughs> that, uh, that from what I covered, um, I got one, one interesting one that, uh, you know, kind of has a surprise ending. And then I got a story from when I was spending some time in a man cave, I guess to say. There you so, go. Uh, Perfect. Interesting, interesting uh, aspect of, of covering football. Let's see. It was 2017. So Tom Herman's first year. Uh, and I get, I get lucky enough to travel up to Morgantown, West Virginia. Uh -oh. And that is a game. That's a team that's got Will Greer. Um, the horns, I think are five and five. Yeah. They're five and five. Uh, battling to just get those 15 extra practices uh, that the bowl would have provided in that first game or in that first year, always important. And there was a huge tight end depth problem because remember Cade Brewer tore his ACL at some point very early in that year as a freshman, Andrew Beck missed the entire year yeah. after a foot injury sustained in fall camp. They took in a Syracuse transfer at tight end uh, who Kendall Moore, who was a, good blocker but was not much of a receiver um so um they were very limited on tight end extremely limited yeah. and they moved running back chris warren to tight end i remember that now and so you know you go through that game sam ellinger plays isn't asked to do a whole lot but kind of manages the game well as a freshman brandon jones breaks uh will greer's finger as he's diving for the goal line knocks it out of his hand and forces it back. Uh, and whoever they brought in just was not good. Um, and some point in the game, Ellinger throws a touchdown to tight end Chris Warren. And it's like, oh, wow, you know, one of the three tight ends and one who's a running back just scored a touchdown. So you, um, I don't know if you've been to Morgantown, but if you're looking at it from the TV angle, the to your right is their football facility. Right. And they spread people around, you know, they open up the doors for the team to run out. And that's basically them running from their locker room through their weight room to the field. And so for media, they would spread a couple players out around that little weight room. And they brought Chris Warren out, who's a, a, a you know, hey, he scored the touchdown. So it's like, you know, hey, you know, congratulations on that touchdown. How's it feel to, you know, do something at the tight end position? And he said something, I wish I, I, I had listened to this, but he said something that it's like, I don't really get happy for myself and I don't really, I don't really care. Like he had scored a touchdown in a new position. And he's just like, he wasn't happy. And I think he wanted to be a running back. Yeah. Um, but just to be that blank after his team won after, and not to, not to drag him, but it's just because, you know, he, he ran hard at Texas and I thought he, he did. did some good things, but like, just to hear like, yeah, you know, I don't really get happy for myself. I'm like, dude, you, you just scored a touchdown in a new position. Not a lot of people can do that. Um, the other good man cave story, let's see, comes from when I was in school. Um, so I was living upstairs at the fraternity house during the NBA playoffs. 
And my friend had this, like, probably the first HD TV ever to come off the line. Uh, and we're watching that uh, Clippers Rocket series. Mm-hmm. I think it was in 2016. Was maybe Blake 2015. Griffin, was Blake Griffin still with the Clippers? He was. He was. Okay. And the Rockets are down 20 something heading into the third quarter. And they take Harden out. And I'm just kind of watching, like, wow, you know, another, another first round exit. And I'm watching with some Houston people. Uh, <laughs> and we're watching, and the bench and the bench starts coming back and starts coming back. And we're kind of looking around, like, are you are you seeing this? Like, don't don't move at all. Like you can't you can't go anywhere. Uh, they come back and come back and come back, and we're just like giddy the whole time. Uh, so that and I'll, I'll always kind of remember watching that in, in room six of, of the fraternity house. Man, I, I've seen I've been lucky enough to see some some good sports stuff, some bad sports stuff. I, I had some fun and so okay, I got one more good one. Good, um, keep them coming. <laughs> we, I went to Omaha in 2018. Uh, that Cody Clemens team, Big 12 mm-hmm. title team, David Pierce's second year. And there was a lot of rain that year. Uh, as there always seems to be at uh, yeah. Charles Charles Schwab Field, Omaha, as it's now called. Oh, I can't say that. I know it's it's still TD Ameritrade works, you know. Even and I wasn't a rose and black oh, guy, God. but TD Ameritrade works, not Charles Schwab Field, Omaha. Um, and so I'm I'm with a mutual friend of ours. I think uh, uh, Vin, old Vinny. Um, yeah. Oh yeah, Alcazar. Yeah. Uh, hanging with him, and he's like, you know. Me and a couple other the beat and some some Texas people we talked to, like, hey, you know, come on by, have a drink. Uh, and uh, uh, wow, well, I'm gonna tell this in public. All right, whatever. Um, <laughs> we uh, we go to the uh, we go hang out with, with Vinny and we're in his right. room, and Keith Moreland's in there, you know, Longhorn legend, great, great baseball player, great football player. And I we we've gone out. Um, and so I'm just kind of sitting and hanging with Keith and talking with him and talking with Vinny. And I think I'm like mid conversation with Keith Moreland and it's like 1230 at night or something like that. And I'm mid conversation with Keith Moreland and I just, just snooze out. Oh my, it was a long night for you. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, I fell asleep on, on, on a long horn on, not on physically, but on, on one of his stories. <laughs> uh while in omaha but yeah that that was that's one of the uh that's one of the favorite things i've done covering this team not falling asleep uh on the keith moreland story but going to omaha and seeing that even though it was two and q that's there's just nothing like that and i i I so wish i could have gone to rosenblatt at least once but unfortunately never made it there but td ameritrade i know they built they built around it great or charles schwab they build a community around it. I know the fields set up odd just so they can show off the hotel in the background, mm-hmm. but it's just a good park mm-hmm. and it's a pitcher's park. And if they're, if your team in playing, you can go find somewhere to, to party for a little while. And it's, it's a fun thing. I, I, I wish, uh, I wish I could go back more often and hopefully I can keep going back more often. Those are great stories. And whenever you involve Keith Moreland and Vinny, you're yeah. in for a good time. Tito's abound. Stories, fun, and Texas baseball. It's a great combination. And I, I hate to throw this on you, but um, I've only I only went to the new part once when I was covering OU. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, Bouchel, Bouchel's b- older brother played for OU, and they had a really good scrappy team. Um, I went the last two years of Rosenblatt on my own on my own time. Had the time of my life, and I hate to just you know, depress you, but across the street, there was a line of old school beer gardens. Uh, I think Starsky's was one of them. Coors Light Tall Boys for $2 and 50 cents. Golly. Yeah. Or $3. Man. The, the one bar I remember at, at, at around uh, Charles Schwab, it's, I think it's the session room or something like that. Um, and then there's another bar. I forget what it's called, but you walk in and you just see lines of eight flags, you know, and then basically what they do is every year they'll move one back and they'll put the eight teams that made it to Omaha and move it back. That's really teams. cool. It, it's, it's, it's a cool spot. I'm, uh, you know, hopefully I can, I can make it back. If it, you know, considering COVID, I got the same access 
on my couch last year as what some people did go into Omaha. But if they had won that last game against uh, Bednar and Sims, I was going to get up that next morning and drive up for drive the championship it. series. Yeah. I thought but, about it too. Having known that now after the fact, we should have coordinated. If they would have <laughs> If I they would have won. I think it would have been you, me, Brad Kellner, and uh oh, we, we would have oh, been, been it would have oh been a God. time. And I, a man, thing. here's the other thing, you know. Um, and you know, a lot of what could have been for that series. I don't even want to get into it. That that was a great run last year for sure for Texas baseball. Great teams. Yeah, it's who knows what how this may be a special ending for Texas baseball this year. We it's just there's a lot of mysterious pieces and moments ahead, I think. Hey, Joe, you're now officially a VIP alumni member of Stories Inside the Man Cave, and I really appreciate you, and you're welcome anytime, my brother. Hey, thank you, man. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, absolutely. For Joe C. and the OG Man Cave boys, that being Hardball Harge, Big Mike, and Coach Mo, we out. You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. I'm in my car in the giddy up.